We actually only have five minutes before we're to wrap up the session. Every person on this panel submitted questions and I also created, oh, a list of about five hours of questions here for all of you. I'd, um, I'd, I'd really like to change course a bit and just I'll take a moment to explain why I'm here in order to give you all a moment to, um, to really come down to just one question and one piece of feedback and I know you weren't um, expecting this so that's why I wanna give you a moment to prepare out of the five minutes that we have left. But the question really comes, um, uh, builds on the comments that all of you have shared, which is how do we hold each other accountable? And how do we do that with a compassion and a shared understanding for the common future that we wish to create? I desperately wanna ask you about each of the things that I have already um, called from you and researched here. But, but the, in the interest of time, I ask you to really, um, th this panel represents the cross-sectoral approaches that are required that are the only way that we will authentically be able to move forward. So if you will, as I'm sharing just a bit of background about why I'm here, um, start to call uh, your ideas about what we can do. Oh, and we're getting more time. You have 10 minutes. Look at what happens. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so we have 10 minutes, excuse me, remaining in the session or to actually have a conversation? To have the conversation, fantastic. Okay, great. So, so what, I'd, what I'd like to know is how we can be accountable to each other and also your feedback on how we can better hold you accountable, you representing the, um, you know, representing industry, representing civil society organizations, representing justice, how we can all start to come together to really actualize this vision. So as you're um, thinking about this, I'll just explain briefly what I'm doing here. I was actually invited to join this panel because of the research I've been doing on agricultural biodiversity. For the past two and a half years, I've traveled across six continents researching agrobiodiversity. And I have seen firsthand the need for integrated landscape approaches to food production. 70% of agricultural production is derived from subsistence farming. Smallholder diversified agrosystems are much more resilient to climate change than large scale industrialized agriculture. Yet, despite their contribution to feeding the world, these are the farmers with some of the least amount of support. Their post harvest losses and yield gaps are high, which is why some of the hungriest people in the world are smallholder farmers. But malnourishment and hunger are not only caused by scarcity, they are caused by poverty, by social strife, by inequality, and by poor infrastructure. And this matters because unsustainable land use changes have been made in the name of feeding hungry people. Agriculture, forestry, and other land use accounts for one third of direct global greenhouse gas emissions and palm oil is the single largest driver of tropical deforestation. Palm oil is one of the five foods that we all eat now. Palm oil, maize, rice, wheat, and soya. This is the new global standard diet. Biodiversity and ecosystem services underpin all our activities in all land use sectors, and we all depend on them. The segregations of functions within a landscape has curtailed any attempt at integrated land use planning and land use management. But from small communities to multi -corpora multinational corporations, protecting the natural wealth of our landscapes is a challenge calling for joint action and accountability. And a holistic approach to understanding the interconnections between all these different land uses. So on that note, I would say that diversity is our greatest asset, both biodiversity and the kind of diversity that's represented on this panel. So I'll turn to Justice Med Benjamin here on my immediate right and ask you to explore the query that I posed. How, how do we hold each other accountable for the challenges that lie ahead? I'm glad you, I'm, I'm glad you gave us 30 seconds to think about the question. I would probably use the most inelegant analogy that comes to mind in 30 seconds, a sandwich. Uh, I think accountability it can be portrayed as a sandwich because we see it as a product, but it's in fact a process. And for a process you need benchmark. So the three parts of this, uh, uh, of this sandwich, 
without very clear benchmarks. And they can be ethical, cultural, legal, religious, uh, but in my case, legal, you won't, you won't have uh, accountability, or at least the type of accountability uh, you'd like. Second, you have to have a good process. And the, the terminology we use in law, and it's familiar to all of you, is due process. But it's more than due process because it has to be democratic, legitimate, transparent, and I could go on and on. And finally, you have the product. And the product is a third part of the sandwich, which is accountability. That's it. Ah, oh, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know if the condiments were going on the sandwich. I just oh, no, wanted no, no, to no. make sure. I was not meditating. I had just finished. <laughs> fantastic. Well, with our extra 10 minutes, I am going to get a chance to ask a follow-up. But I would like to continue on this trajectory for a moment. Ms. Kakabadze, how do we hold each other accountable? There are so many elements that we have to work on that I think it's terribly complex question and very difficult to answer with just one shot. But I definitely think that the presence of uh, Antonio Benjamin here is giving a strong signal about sectors that need to be involved. Day before, yes, two days ago, the um, Anglican Church made a request to Shell and BP to be more responsible, to reduce the footprint on climate. And that's big news. Where is the church? Should be here. Where are the judges, the other judges, in addition, in addition to Antonio? They should be here. There are still sectors of society that, have, that are not being invited, involved, or interested in participating in, in this debate. I think lots of good things are happening already. There is a, a tremendous number of institutions that are already working with a vision of landscape, of integration, of institutions. But unless we bring synergies amongst these sectors, I think it'll be very difficult to to overcome barriers that still exist. And I just want to mention one of those barriers, the, the, the perverse incentives for fossil fuels. If we don't bring the sectors that can take decisions on those incentives, we are, uh, as we say in Spanish, labrando en el mar, trying to, to farm in the sea. To farm in the ocean. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pullman. Yeah, I, I actually want to build on Yolanda's point because I think at the end of the day, um, we need laws, rules, and regulations, and you need to enforce them in many different things, including uh, human rights, like we have the Ruggie framework and other things. But at the end of the day, it's an issue of morality, and we just have to hold ourselves to higher standards. We. Um, just are in the same year of the uh, Millennium Development Goals to uh, eradically, uh, irreversibly eradicate poverty in a more sustainable and equitable way. That's a thing we should all rally to. That's a moral level that is higher than any law. I, I firmly believe that whatever rules and law you put in place, which the wells have been done for a long time, and certainly can be put to a higher level, there will be people that operate under a different principle. So let's speak for business, which I apparently represent on this panel. It's that business needs to start to realize that it's not there to serve the shareholders, but it's there to serve society in the first place. When it serves society well, shareholders will be rewarded. But we're here to, to make positive contributions to, to, um, to the broader, uh, broader world first and foremost. And that is the starting point. Therefore, uh, initiatives of redefining value, measuring things that count, measuring these externalities, Getting out of this red race of short-termism, driving more leaders that are willing to speak up and apart. At the end of the day, it's leaders that make that change. Now, we're living in a wonderful age, which is the age of transparency. Whatever the pluses and minuses of the internet, there's one thing for sure. There's not many places to hide anymore. So the more we can measure and track these commitments, the more we can make them public, and that's why we put out these responsible sourcing codes or these industry commitments, the more we are able to hold ourselves accountable. Well, 
And in all this is a, a firm understanding that, uh, that it's not about us, it's about others. Uh, the, as I always say, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Thank you. Senor Nasua. Gracias. Eh, consideramos que el primer nivel de responsabilidad que tenemos todos that we have, all of us, is to life, everyone's lives. And this is the first level of responsibility that we have to assume. But how can we do this when each of us feels part of their own role? And with, from the indigenous people's point of view, we're talking about intergenerational perspectives in which our ancestors, our grandparents, uh, help us to see what will happen with the process of climate change. Uh, women have a leading role for guaranteeing the vitality of our people's culture also have a key role. Young people must be leaders in future, but they must develop their own capacities now. In which authorities, which are now assuming a leadership, then we can indicate that what we're doing what sh they should be by what we do today, what we don't do. So we all have a leading role within society, but above all, this role is for preserving the life of our Mother Earth and our planet. It's a role to preserve life, but in a world and society in which equalities are clearly defined, and not a world in which and uh, business people want to be richer, making poorer people poorer. But as we indigenous people say, we are rich. And part of, uh, part of this wealth is the forest that we have. Part of this wealth is, as, uh, as you say in English, landscape. It's the landscape. This is our wealth. Our wealth is yourselves. It's our wealth is the planet. If we do not feel that we are rich in this, how are we going to maintain it? That is our main responsibility, maintaining this. Thank you. Thank you. So I have time for just one quick follow-up question and um, to each of you, and that, if you would keep your answers very short, I would be grateful, and, and so would the organizers. Um, to this point, uh, Senor Masua, of recognizing the wealth, the sad truth is, and I, I recognize this in my work as a journalist, is that that wealth has not been recognized. Deforestation is happening uh, at a rapid pace, and the wealth that you describe simply must be recognized. And the stakeholder value, Mr. Pullman, that you described simply must be recognized. But we don't seem to live in a world where a lot of that is going on. And um, as someone who has often been quick to hold people accountable, I will say um, this, this representation of the people who have worked here together, the cross-sector work that has happened with WWF and with Unilever, for example, I mean, Unilever has gone from being called out for deforestation to committing to zero deforestation. If you could just briefly, um, each of you talk about in your work, one of the biggest challenges that you faced that will perhaps help all of us as we hold you accountable to also do so with compassion and to understand some of the struggles that you are facing internally. So I will start actually with uh, Senor Mesua. Uno de los principales desafíos Mm, for uh, the indigenous peoples, well, talking in general now, is the question of law or rights in which we recognize and we realize that people, the, the right of indigenous people to remain in the forest is, is established and and that companies that recognize this right are much more likely to be successful. So this challenge is something that we want to see in all the companies and that they should be fully responsible for acting like that because the states and governments depend on the economics of society. 
And if society developed by economics is not fully responsible, it will not be responsible to society. Gracias. When, uh, would say, uh, we need to uh, change the environment. The biggest barriers are, uh, are the environment in which we operate. The three biggest challenges that you see is this, this pressure on short term versus long term, this, this economic system of few versus many that you refer to, and then this battle that we have of man versus nature, which in the end, by the way, is not a battle of man versus nature, it's man against itself. Ultimately, the nature will be doing fine. So we have to focus on those things. We have to start broadening the definition of accounting, for example, and go to this redefining value I was talking about. You know, if you're a capitalist, which a lot of the business people tend to think they are, they are now just single-mindedly focused on optimizing uh, financial capital. But if we redefine that into natural capital or social capital, then I still believe a capitalist is very well placed to optimize that. So we need to get on with this broader definition of reporting. And I'm actually glad again that the Secretary General in his submission after the Open Working Group again refers to that in, uh, in hopefully the uh, sustainable development goals we are getting. Well, Business Council is leading a project on that. We're getting many more involved. That is the incentive system. The second one is we need to change the financial market and provide more reward for uh, patient capital. You don't solve these issues of food security or climate change or hunger or employment and, uh, and the issues are piling up with, uh, with quarterly activities. They require actions over two, three, four year times. You take the efforts that we're leading on getting rid of the uh, deforestation. The commitment is by 2020. A lot of people are impatient. Why can't you do it earlier? But the transitions that you need to make are just awfully long and take time. And the third thing we need to work once more, I want to come back to that, is, is leaders. I always say we're short of leaders and trees. And that's about what we're talking here on the panel today. We need to create a different system of education. We need to create a different system of development so that we have the right people to lead us. Uh, out, of, out of these issues that we've talked ourselves into. Now, I'm very encouraged by the young people. If you look at where 80% of the world population will be, it's outside of Europe and the US. 50% of these people are below 25 years old. I've seen certainly in my reads out that uh, although they are 50% of today's world, they definitely understand they're 100% of tomorrow's world. And we need to get not only like the indigenous people involved, but we also need to far more involve the young people in giving them a, a share on the podium. So if we focus on these things, leadership, short-termism, natural capital, and uh, providing a voice at the table of the right people, I think we can go quite far and quite quickly in solving these issues. Thank you. And of course, that also includes the transformation of shareholder expectations. Oh, absolutely. But unfortunately, uh, increasingly, there is uh, hard evidence that uh, this all makes good sense. Uh, even for the people that don't believe in this human dignity and respect and all the things we've talked about, uh, there is a point that we've already had arrived where, as I said, the cost of not doing anything is starting to become higher than the cost of doing things, which actually is a good situation to be in. Sad situation, but it's a good situation to be in. We might as well start exploiting that. And increasingly, you see that companies start to realize and, and financial institutions start to realize. Uh, uh, the, the World Bank uh, climate uh, statement to call for a price on climate during the climate summit was signed by a thousand companies. We have 24 trillion of capital now calling for a price on carbon. So things are changing. Uh, it's not only anymore the Koch brothers. So the, unfortunately what we have to do now is make the silent majority the focal majority and don't give that voice to the focal minority. Indeed, well said. Ms. Kakabad, say that is certainly something that WWF is involved in. Can you address my question or talk about the ways in which you are empowering this silent majority? Either way you'd like to go. I'd, I'd like to, to stress the obstacles that mm. we need to overcome. And uh, I think number one is politicians mm -hmm. that you have already referred to. Politicians that are looking into a three, four or five year term and you don't see results or measure results necessarily in such a short term. And unfortunately, they have captured the vision or the potential to construct a longer term vision. And, and when I say they, is the short, um, uh, the, the short vision uh, individuals that are exercising power today. Not all of them, of course, but the great majority. 
The second uh, obstacle is how do we communicate such a complex issue as the threats of climate change, for example. And unless we are able to engage uh, the mother, the grandmother, and the grandchild into understanding what is happening today, we won't succeed because this very small privileged group of individuals cannot engage the large majority, that silent majority that needs to get involved. And the third one, which I think all of us suffer from, is we don't learn from experience. How do we share knowledge, not only on successes, but also on failures, in order not to repeat and duplicate failures or successes of the past, but learn from them in order to avoid or replicate them? To make new mistakes. Thank you. Thank you. And Justice Benjamin. Well, I think uh, from a legal perspective, I would see uh, two, two main challenges. One to law itself and the other one to, to judges. The one to law has to do with the need to, um, to bring the, the earth ethics to other areas of law in addition to environmental law. I think we have done quite well with environmental law. We have green constitutions. Uh, it's all the way down to municipal uh, laws um, um, at present. But there are, law is not just environmental law. What about corporate law? What about tax law? Uh, agrarian reform law? And I could go on and on. So I think this would be uh, the first challenge to make sure that we positively contaminate those other areas of law uh, with this earth ethics. For judges, the challenge, is, and, and I will use the term landscape, is, uh, is not small. Because first is to integrate all those pieces, but judges are engineers of words. And landscape is one of those words that mean technically what it's supposed to mean in English, but it doesn't mean the same thing in Latin language. So we translate this into a, a paysage, but as you know, paysage uh, um, brings us to romanticism, to the French uh, romantics or to the American uh, romantics, but also to elitism. And what we want to do here is exactly to be able to capture the essence, the spirit uh, of landscape into uh, our own language or, or common language. So this is an extra challenge for judges to integrate um, the, the, the different pieces of the environment into the legal, um, the judicial discourse, but also to change the nature uh, of a term, of a word that has a life in itself. We have been able to do this in the past. For example, pollution, is not, nowadays it's a legal term, but it was n not a legal term um, 150 years ago. Uh, pollution was a term uh, that meant uh, contamination of the spirit. So it was a, a term used in religious books, and we completely changed this, and now it's pollution of everything, but perhaps not of the spirit. Thank you. I'm so um, thrilled by the moral imperatives and challenges you all have set before us and for a redefinition of landscape and abundance. I thank you all so much for your flexibility as well as for your insights. And I would like to invite to the ta stage Tony Simons. And as he is approaching the stage, I will just say our coffee break has been pushed back and it will last until 11.45. But bear with us for one more minute, please. Ah. <laughs> It's happening. But that mime was great. 